We're looking at the Impressionists. It's 19th century. The French paintings of this time are among the most familiar images of art in mass culture. They are widely accepted by the general public, but in their time, Impressionists actually started out as radicals. When it was first exhibited, their art was thought of as disturbing, unskillful, too strange, even insincere, which is actually exactly what most people seem to think about contemporary art, that is a farce. Group artists rented photographer Nadar's old studio on the first floor. A group of artists, Monet, Renoir, Pissarro, Sisley, Cézanne, Bert Morisot, Edgar Degas, and several other artists, founded the Société Anonyme Coopérative, that is, Cooperative of Anonymous Association of Painters, Sculptors, and Engravers, to exhibit their work independently. This is the title page catalog and the photograph of the no longer existing studio. And the show, that first exhibition, stood in opposition of the Salon because it was not a juried exhibition, so different than the Salon in that way, and actually their works would have been rejected by the Salon and the French Academy. And everyone was allowed to exhibit the work in equal footing, so it was a democratic way to exhibit. This is Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise, 1872. It's a moment like sunrise or sunset that in reality, if you're looking at it, it can take seconds to drastically change all the colors that you're looking at in the landscape. So you have to paint very quickly and you have to be very precise with the mixing of the adequate color in relation to other colors of the canvas because you're working in relationships. Whatever you place is going to be conversing with whatever comes next in terms of color and shape. Monet here has chosen an intense combination of blue and orange, which are complementary colors on the color wheel and have a vibrating optical effect. I could also say orange and green because it's a blue green and it's a orangey red. Those also are opposites and have a vibrating effect when you're looking at it. It's just, it's as if this sun is jumping out of the sky. It's as if it's moving that orange circle. And also looking at the way that the painting has had to synthesize what is being shown. The sky and the horizon line have blurred into the same color field and the viewer has that more synthesized gauge of that moment, that time of day, the light, that sky, the reflection of water, rather than a more descriptive image of the sea, the horizon, the boats and the people, if you remember that Renaissance paintings of Northern Europe. Artists themselves distinguish between sketches and the final painting, especially before this time, there is always, there were previous sketches before the final finished large painting. But in these paintings, the line between those two, sketch and final painting, are made blurry. And um, that is a very audacious move because these artists are regarding their paintings finished when the status quo would say that they are still unfinished. The further and further you go in working the painting, the less fresh it becomes because of the nature of the paint. And also, all paint takes a long time to dry. The more you work, if it is not dry, the more muddy your colors get. So these artists were bringing to light this immediacy of the material of oil paints as much as they were looking to capture the outside world. The mocking name Impressionism derives from this impression Sunrise, which was used in a critic review in a Parisian newspaper. The article took the form of a dialogue between two skeptical viewers of that work in that exhibition. One states sarcastically, Impression, sunrise, 
impression, I was certain of it. I was just telling myself that since I was impressed, there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom, what ease of workmanship. Wallpaper in its embryonic state is more finished than that landscape. Pretty harsh words. But in spite of this opposition from the conventional art community, independent exhibitions eventually brought them to prominence during the 1870s and 1880s. So when they were still alive, they had a taste of success. These impressionist paintings are about capturing the fleeting immediacy of a moment. In this sense, these are more akin to romanticism than realism because it's that about that impulse of the moment capturing an essence and an experience. In this sense, it's the experience of looking. More specifically, Monet is concerned with how the changes in light affect the visible world and how to transfer these observations of light, water and weather through paint. This loose way of applying paint was an adequate way to capture the transience of water and reflected light. It is about the reflection of flickering moments and it's a moving moment in water. These had to be quick brush strokes as well. It's a network of brushes that we are looking at which are larger bits of paint as you are closer in the vantage point of the painting and smaller and smaller as they get farther away into the distance. And also they're flatter and they're also blurrier as you get farther away. And this can be observable, but it's made very noticeable when you look at a photograph. It can only capture clarity of whatever it takes focus on. That's the way the camera operates. And actually, that's the way the human eye operates. But it also was an adequate way of working in plein air painting, which was a novel way to paint in great part due to the mobility that this invention of paint tubes and portable easels allowed artists of that time. But also for artists working out of their studios, moving into the real world, that's a very different scenario to make a painting. It must have been an inspiration for them and that, that made them want to capture that quickly changing modern city and those new subjects to paint which emerge at this time. Monet lived for five years on the River Seine. He knew the work of Turner, the British artist, and that of Constable as well. And he was alert, especially of Turner, and his work with nature, studying the impact of the ever-changing light and weather conditions. His work had a profound influence on painters of this time, including Monet. And so we see at the right a sketch by Turner and on the left, it's very similar, those approaches to capturing a landscape and to capturing atmosphere and sky. But also Monet, Constable, Turner, and Whistler in the United States, and also post-impressionist artists a bit later, who were artists all of this period, were influenced with the quickness and the framing of Asian painters. So on the right, we're looking at a Zen priest Seshu. It's his work of the Muromachi period, it's ancient China, in his quick brushstroke style, termed Haboku. And on the top left, we're looking at a constable sketch again. And on the bottom right, it's Monet's sunrise. This is a footage of Monet painting painting the water lilies in a pond, which was a subject of many of his paintings.
Also other aspects that painting outside involve are battling against wind and the light hitting your eye or hitting the canvas and also that wind moving the canvas and possibly making your easel fall. Those are other contingencies of landscape painting. There's an overall way of working, which if you can see, Monet is there painting with, he holds one color and then paints in different places, not just area by area, which many previous painters did. And he doesn't also, he draws through painting rather than draw first and paint later, which was also a convention. And this is his garden at Giverni. His water lilies show the reflection of light given by the surface of the pond and which takes up the entire canvas. So that view frame makes the viewer lose oneself or herself rather to what position she is viewing. These are the a curved, massive paintings of a series of paintings. In the close-up of those paintings, one can see how his gestures are brisk, lively, and have the confidence of an artist who had looked long enough to know, with eyes closed, the nature of what he was painting and the material of paint and understood color relationship very, very well. He came to know color and painting so well that he continued painting even when he could barely see anymore in his final years. It is possibly a, a blindness that was due to the effects of those strong chemicals of the oil paints, which have m more adverse effect than one. This intensity of the brush strokes and colors also grew stronger with this paint as he could see less and less. It is possible also that in order for him to be able to see that color, he had to make those colors more intense as his sight grew dimmer and dimmer. This is a work by Monet as well at the beach all sorts of weather conditions. The snow on a landscape. The fumes at St. Lazare train station. Monet began to paint this series with the same subject under various conditions in different times of the day. Monet rented spaces for this cathedral across the street where he could set up temporary studios for this very purpose. Uh, so this is the Rouen Cathedral. The paintings capture the facade of the cathedral and reflect the changes in its appearance under these lighting conditions. So that light distorts what is being looked at. More than 30 in all were made between 1892 and 1893 and then reworked in Monet's studio in 1894. Which is a common thing to do, to do a landscape painting outside and then if you still had more things to work on because you had that experience of looking, then you would continue to work in your studio. Also in the first exhibition, and part of that group of painters, is Camille Pissarro. Pissarro was an artist and a socialist, one of the few Impressionist artists who tried to come to terms with the industrial site, which is another aspect of the city. It is that industry itself, which was the cause of urban expansion, 
uh, was actually largely evaded and ignored by the Impressionists. So the Impressionists picked the pretty sides. And so that makes the, the Impressionists fall within Romanticism rather than realism because it's a more idealized view. So this is Pizarro's paintings of the street outside the Boulevard Montmartre in different stages and different iterations. And at night, which is another challenge. Oh, this is a portrait of Cezanne by Pizarro. Cezanne, who we're going to talk about in a bit. Photographs and news clippings in the background that you see there started to appear in paintings. And it was not only an influence of Asian painting, because Asian paintings did that. They showed other images within the images. But it was also the appearance of the photography and photographic prints allowed the reproduction of images in a way that had never been done previously, because there's an authenticity to painting, because it's done only once, it's not replicated. And so it was also the camera that gave artists a way of looking which was new and novel. It was this intrinsic nature of the snapshots and view frames that look in a way that one might not know it through the naked eye. So in a photograph, the edges get cut off and things and people appear shifted to the sides. This would not happen commonly in a painting. If you remember those portrait paintings, everything is centered, especially certain paintings that neoclassicists would center things. This is the dance class by Edgar Degas, also part of the group of artists of this time. Uh, artists like Degas, it's particularly him, grew very aware about strong diagonals and uh, how to use them in compositions and what effect that had. emphasizing on the outside edges as well. The out outside edges of the view frame that makes the edges more intense in order to make a more dynamic composition, a more dramatic angle of vision and a greater sense of depth to an image. That uh, composition is extraordinary. It's so effective. It's uh, almost like I'm looking at a, a still from, from film. Fantastic, those horses. So the guy had to be there for a long time in the horse races. And this is very hard to, to capture a, a moving animal. <laughs> because they are very quick on their feet and they how, how well the, the proportions of horses are captured by him, it's, it's extraordinary. And look at the patches of color for the grass, that is a different way of working, it's the up and down brush strokes rather than across. In the 1880s, a number of young ambitious artists thought that the Impressionist technique had taken them as far as it could. They pushed beyond that in many different ways. This group of artists are called post-Impressionists. This is Georges Seurat. During the 19th century, scientists wrote treaties on color, optical effects, and perception. They adapted the scientific research into a form accessible to lay people. Artists followed new discoveries in perception with great interests. His great contribution was producing a color wheel 
of primary and intermediary hues, which we have just talked about already. So those are the complementary colors on the color wheel. And that's on the right, you see those points of pure color that Serrat is working with. And the color dots combine together in the eye of the beholder, but are separate. This brush stroke behaves more like atoms, really, than the way we see them in reality. But it's not quick like the Impressionists, it's the opposite. It's slow and through layering. It is ordered and rigorous. It's rational, even. It's lacking in spontaneity, though that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It's just a very different thing. It's actually a look at the same river from opposite sides, the side of the rich and the side of the workers on the left. This is a photograph of Paul Gauguin, a French post-impressionist artist who was not well appreciated until after his death. This is his self-portrait. He's showing himself as both good and evil and as a sinner as well. And it's a very symbolic way of making a portrait. Gauguin was later recognized for his experimental use of color and synthetist style that were distinguishably different from Impressionism. His work was influential to the French avant-garde and many modern artists such as Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse, very clear influences there. This is another self-portrait of his. Here you can see his interests, his concerns. The themes that he had had to do with him moving off to new lands. He wound up in Tahiti in 1891 because he needed new subjects, something that was different from the old views modern France was providing him. He thought that was a site that was spent out. He uses creative shapes and really does synthesize in his own way and involves then the imagination and also his capacity to create shapes where there are none, where they might be just a, a flowing landscape where suddenly Gauguin is there giving shape to space. It's almost like a puzzle of shapes that he puts together in somehow an odd quilt filled with abstract shapes as well. And crazy colors on that sand that suddenly looks pink that's really taking color to another level is painting beyond what you see and more painting how you see something or how you decide to portray something that you are looking at in the media of paint and there's also a quality it's that flatness of the canvas which is it's actually a pictorial space that is flat Gauguin here is beginning to show us something that modern artists, abstract artists, are going to take. This is a portrait of Vincent van Gogh by Gauguin. So it's taken before his trip to Tahiti. And it, interestingly, it almost looks like a self-portrait of Paul Gauguin. It's a mix, I feel, because we saw the photographs of Gauguin previously. So among Gauguin's circles was the Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh one of the most famous painters. Everybody knows this artist. Images of his work have been reproduced in oh so many ways. That's him and his self-portrait. Van Gogh had moved to Paris in 1886, where he was initially influenced by the Impressionists. He was a self-taught artist. He quickly adapted Seurat's divisionist technique to his own. But rather than dots, he used three multidirectional dashes of impasto, those are thickly applied pigments, which give his paintings great energy and texture and also complexity. And here you can see that influence of Serrat in the background, but also those rhythmic patterns and also chaotic. That's that part of that energy, almost a wild way of painting that he had. And also an innate colorist because he didn't study color or color theory. He just had a sense of it. And he taught himself to draw through reading books on how to draw, which is, I think, uh, not an easy way to learn to draw. But it made it interesting because the drawing in his paintings are very much his because when you learn 
learn to draw in properly in a university or in a school, you learn to draw in a certain way and you're influenced very much. But since Van Gogh was an autodidact in painting, he was the good side of that. The strong side was that he was able to develop a sense of himself much more where in university it can sometimes work to the contrary. So you might probably know from pictures and even there's an animation of his paintings in a film that when Van Gogh finally met with Gauguin, they fought and it ended up in a violent confrontation that we know because Vincent writes many letters to his brother Theo, who was a gallery dealer. Van Gogh may have been shot or he may have shot himself, it is unknown, but Van Gogh suffered from psychological crisis. His work contributed to the emergence of an expressionistic tradition, which is based on the idea that an artist's feelings are infused by whatever he depicts. And also that what one is painting is really a vehicle for that expression. And he was contemplating death and wrote to his brother, just as we take the train to get to Tarka San Ruen, we take death to reach a star. So he, he was using this landscape in a poetic way for a, the expression of a different range of feeling. This is visible in the cypress tree, a traditional symbol of death and eternal life, which rises to link earth and heaven. And this idea of eternal life also had influences on his great faith in the Christian religion. He was a, a, a very pious follower of the Christian faith. Objects can also, for Van Gogh, be portraits, as if he was painting himself as a chair. So this would be a painting of a chair, or could it be another self-portrait? This is Van Gogh, but what you're looking at are a pair of shoes. This it was his life. It was a suffered life, and it was a life w where he went to the farthest extents. He worked outside the city. He turned to isolation in order to pursue his desire to be an artist. This is one of his last paintings. He had thought preemptively about the symbolism of that composition. He was already seeing that his life might not last much longer. We know this from a letter to his brother Theo, and he had in his mind the entire composition. And look at those dark clouds coming as if thunder is going to come, it's getting dark suddenly, light is going to change. Uh, it's a somber image. Another post-impressionist artist who was better off than most, he was aristocratic by birth, but had the disadvantage that he had physical troubles that were congenital. His genetic disorder is still unknown. It is called sometimes the Lutrec syndrome. This is Toulouse-Lutrec. He was not very tall, but this allowed for him to paint uh, in, in a different world, sort of the underworld. So he came out at nighttime. He went behind the scenes where mostly men were not allowed to paint. He painted uh, where dancers are changing themselves. He was allowed to paint there and being shorter. He had already that one up with a dramatic vantage point because he was looking lower below. That added to his qualities of representation. But he's capturing a different vantage point, the modern life, the city life in Paris, the loneliness and alienation that modern cities brought. This is where graphic design comes from. These are illustrative posters, not typically known to be art in their day, but they, they are graphic illustrations that often qualify for many, had a good deal of vision for the future. This is the forerunner of modern advertising, magazines, television, and those sorts of work. Pop art, a hundred years early, really is what it is. If you think of Andy Warhol, those flat spaces of color. 
it's just it's just what Toulouse Lutrec's works were doing. They're lithographs. Toulouse Lutrec portrayed Parisian night scenes with a similar touch of Japanese portrait artists. His Parisians in makeup out on the town were not unlike Japanese kabuki theater with heavy makeup and graphic shocking portrayal of faces in theatrical frozen expressions. This was known in France as Japanese, this influence of uh, Japanese art, but it's also Chinese art, we cannot deny that. It's also influenced by printmaking, which already had existed in the Renaissance even. It's as if he has a mishmash between what is print, what is drawing, and what is painting, all in his works. Japan was forced into trade in 1853. Japan art became available to European and American artists. One of the first works that influenced them was a sketchbook called Manga by Hokusai, which several Parisian artists eagerly looked at and passed around. There's that tendency for simplicity, flatness, and breaking with perspective. It became fashionable to collect Japanese objects. Manet painted a portrait of Emile Sola surrounded by Japanese screen and woodblock prints. The background and the foreground are equally important, equally dynamic part of that composition. Monet cut the fever too. With his wife, the Japanese fever cut everyone. And that Japanese figure on the kimono seems more lively even than Monet's wife. Here is one of the most influential painters to come from the 19th century in Europe. Paul Cezanne is cited as a precursor to the Cubist movement. He had a remarkable ability to paint and also change what he was looking at. He's transforming here. He's restructuring what he's looking at. He's showing multiple views at the same time from the right eye and the left eye and his painting produces a kind of tangible distance that goes beyond that atmospheric perspective because he's not looking at that, but he is looking at the way to, to the structure that surface. The angles seem chiseled and the modeling of the form is all about edge and distance and optical variation. Close things appear far away and far things appear to be close by. And the switches here are calculated and constructing with care by Cezanne. It seems like he is more aware of drawing in his paintings than Paul Cezanne because Paul Cezanne is also structuring the space that he is portraying. But here, Cezanne makes stronger gestures with the lines and the breaking up of spaces and introducing diagonals. Those angles aren't there. He's like painting a landscape as if he were painting a city. Besides his landscapes, Paul was a master of still life. There is this disjointedness that does not resolve from accident or incompetence, but intentionality. And artists like him and artists that are going to come after Cezanne are going to be very intentional in the way they work. In the case of Cezanne, it allowed this discipline to introduce a new way of painting things. And here we really can see a certain awkwardness of perspective that's going to be like cubism. So there's a disjointedness between one side of the table and the other side. One is higher up, one is down. It doesn't make sense in perspective. That actually would be the result of looking at something. If you open one eye and close the other simultaneously and alternate between the two switching, you'll notice that your field of vision shifts. It is true that stereoscopic vision was occurring 
in the time of Cezanne. So that was something that was probably in his mind and probably imposed him to, to, to paint uh, and think about the way of seeing that optical vision.